What are you? Can you hear us? Sounds good to me. Yep. Well, we're all here, so thank you, you two, for joining. Welcome to our Reddit talk, all about privacy. It doesn't have to be just related to cryptocurrency privacy, but of course, that will be one of the covered topics because this is ultimately on the cryptocurrency subreddit. So thank you, everyone, for joining us this Thursday afternoon for most people in the U.S. or very, very late in Europe if you're still here. We're just going to get started with asking, you know, I have some intro things to go through, and then make sure you can raise your hand so I can invite you on stage to answer, you know, ask questions. This is meant to be kind of like a, a fun Q&A session. Uh, so first, we have... Henry from TechLore, and we have Seth from OptOut uh, Pod. So I want to start with with you, Henry. Can you talk? Um, can you just give a background of you know what TechLore is, what you, what you do on the privacy side? Yeah. First, um, excuse the the cursed uh, username uh, that hasn't been changed in a long time, and I hope to change it. <laughs> um, but um, I'm Henry, and I own TechLore, and we produce pretty much privacy and security related content that goes on YouTube, PeerTube, as well as Odyssey. And we've been doing it for the last, well, we've been a team for the last year or two. And then after, before then, it was just me. And I've been posting content for the last five or so years. And pretty much the goal is to spread privacy to the masses. We also host some tools on our website. And we're just doing our best to get the word of privacy out there in a very uh, digestible format for the average person. I mean, I, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Congrats. Um, what about you? Uh, what about you, Seth? Yeah, so uh, I go by Seth for privacy. Um, I've been in the cryptocurrency and privacy space for a while, definitely more recently in the in the privacy space, kind of as I just realized how privacy is not just important in cryptocurrencies, but has much, much broader implications. Um, and so my main contribution before starting Opt Out Podcast was really just trying to um, just share what I was learning on, on Twitter and on Reddit. Um, but I started Opt Out Podcast in, uh, I think it was June of this year. Um, so fairly recent, but Opt Out is basically just a show where um, I sit down with people who are passionate to learn why privacy matters to them and then talk about the tools and techniques they found and leveraged and um, really just to encourage and inspire other people towards personal privacy and, and data sovereignty. Um, so wrapping up season one there, but it's it's been a blast to get to just interact with a ton of people, um, see their personal privacy journey, the ways that their privacy has kind of taken hold of their lives and, and help them to uh, make some good changes. And then also just to see the, the community forming around privacy in, in many different circles. Um, so yeah, it's been a blast. I love your podcast. Thanks, Henry. <laughs> I hate it. I think it's terrible. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. We love you, Seth. Um, yeah, we all do have pretty bad Reddit usernames, to be completely honest. Um, but we can just go past that, too. <laughs> um, so one really common question that people get on any privacy related podcast, and I'm sorry for being cliche, but one thing people always ask is, what does your privacy journey look like? Seth, you're, you're guilty of saying of wow. doing this to people. So I'm going to do it to first. What, what was your privacy journey, Seth? I don't think I've uh, had to answer my own question yet, so this will be interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, so for me, it actually started from uh, getting into cryptocurrency. Um, I got into crypto kind of in the in the boom of late 2017, early 2018, and uh, just by nature of enjoying working with hardware, I, I wanted to get into mining. So I, I ended up kind of stumbling into the Monero community um, purely to mine it, not caring about what it could be used for, not caring about the privacy guarantees, anything like that. Um, and really just people in the Monero community kind of took me under their wing and were just very honest about how privacy is important in, in many more broad ways than just uh protecting our financial privacy. The financial privacy is obviously extremely important, but it's a much more uh, broad topic and something that people really need to take seriously in their in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so that kind of kick-started the, the journey for me and got me thinking a little bit more about that. Um, but it was really reading through a couple books about the revelations that came out of Snowden. I mean, I know that's a common, a common story a lot of people hear is that, that the the information we learned from Edward Snowden's uh, just leaks from the government was super, super important in helping me to see that uh, the governments and corporations that I thought were on my side had not been on my side and had been actively working together to uh, surveil and um, manipulate American citizens and uh, and people all across the world, and that this was a really a deeply rooted problem in. Um, surveillance capitalism and in, in governments today that were continually pushing the boundaries of 
of uh, just preying on their citizens' privacy to be able to have greater and greater control and uh, ability to control what the what citizens do. Um, so coming out of those revelations, that really kind of woke me up to to needing to start worrying about how I'm handling my data and really just a really simple way to put privacy is just that it's a it's a um, a way that you can selectively reveal yourself to the world. So I wanted to be able to have a say in what the world knew about me. I didn't want Google to know everything about me. I didn't want Apple to know everything about me. I didn't want the government to know everything about me. I wanted to be able to selectively reveal that information to to who I wanted. Um, and really that got things started. Um, once I fell down that rabbit hole, it, it happened very quickly. And I just, I started to kind of realize all the different aspects that privacy affects in, in life. And um, some really interesting recent learning has just been that really privacy is a requirement for intimacy and community. Um, Cause if you've revealed everything about yourself to the world, there's nothing that you can reveal to someone in private that can build an intimate relationship. There's nothing that you can have that's unique to you and a specific community around you. If everything about you is known by the world, if everything is known about you by uh, the corporations or the government. So um, really just kind of walking through that. And I'm, I'm still fairly early in my privacy journey. I've only really been caring deeply about privacy for about maybe a year, a year and a half max. Um, so I'm pretty new, but I've just really realized how important it is. And I'm trying to do what I can to help other people see the same thing. And then once they see that, um, to be able to just have the, the tools and educational material at, at hand to be able to um, jump in and, and start thinking more deeply about their personal privacy. Awesome. Thanks so much, Seth. So Henry, you've been around for a bit longer. What does your journey look like? Um, so everything started as mostly, so I originally got into VPNs because as many people know who went to school, uh, lots of things are blocked on school Wi-Fi networks. So uh, my original story kind of started there with how to bypass some of the restrictions found on the local networks and um, VPNs were a common tool that came up. And the cool thing, even though we're very critical of VPNs and I personally am as well, um, just because they're not all in one anonymity tools as they're normally marketed to be. Um, one thing is they're normally a great conversation starter in terms of privacy. And so that was kind of a big pivot for me is when I started learning about privacy of these tools. And so um, really the big shift for me was when I picked up Kevin Mitnick's book um, talking about privacy. And I read the Kevin Mitnick book and I fell in love with it. There was all the surveillance mechanisms, 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 sorry, that he was talking about that just really clicked with me. And it was just so cool and fascinating to learn about all of these things. Um, the book is called The Art of Invisibility. Um, I really recommend it for people getting started in the privacy world just because you will learn a lot. And it is a little bit dated, but I think just the general principles are, are still completely up to date. And from there, I, it kind of is a very massive rabbit hole, as I'm sure uh, many people who are in the cryptocurrency world know about. Um, once you learn a little bit about privacy and you start learning about it and you start implementing one or two things, it's kind of hard to stop there. And actually, my journey has been a lot of just trying to figure out where I want things to, to I guess, stay in my life. So my privacy journey started. And then it got pretty extreme really fast. And then I kind of dialed things back. And I'm always trying to find the middle ground and figure out, you know, what I want to do. It's hard having a public persona and chasing after these things. So that's kind of my struggle. Absolutely. I remember feeling like such a badass in high school for using VPNs and stuff. I was like, I'm so cool. I wonder if anyone else has felt that way. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It was just kind of a weird thing in high school. They're a great, um, they're a great conversation starter because people are familiar with VPNs. They're not seen as a criminal oriented tool. They're seen as just a very normal tool to use and they're normally marketed for privacy and security. So it's normally a great conversation starter, um, even if they are over marketed for probably the wrong reasons. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I'm sure we could talk all day about VPNs, but I think we can talk about some other stuff instead. Yes, so. let's, pl please, let's, <laughs> let's. <laughs> You're like, please, let, let me put this behind me. Um, but what's up? So uh, back to Seth, there's, um, if you had to tell people one key thing that they could do just on a privacy generally, so outside of crypto, and then let's introduce crypto a little bit. One thing that they could do for privacy on crypto, what are the two recommendations you would have? So one for general privacy and one for cryptocurrency specifically? Yes. Okay. Um, it's hard to boil it down to to one specific thing. Um, I think to kind of give a cheat answer, the 
the key area to start is really where you see the most need for privacy in, in your specific um, life or your specific threat model, which a threat model is really just a way to decide what's important to you to to secure and keep private and then how to how to do that. Um, so that can definitely differ. I think one of the maybe simplest tools towards gaining some privacy back um, is really just starting to use a, a better browser and some very simple um, privacy preserving plugins um, just that can help you help you gain some privacy when you're when you're browsing the web. Um, obviously, we do the majority of what we do today in a web browser or on apps on our phones. Um, so I think starting to use a, a better browser with some simple plugins like uBlock Origin, um, like Local CDN is another one. Um, Clear URLs is another one of my favorite browser plugins. Uh, I think those can be a, a nice, easy way that doesn't really affect your kind of day to day too much. Um, those are pretty straightforward to implement. So I think that's probably a probably a good intro step there, but it, it very much will depend on what's specifically important to you. Like if you want to protect mobile privacy, if, if you're more concerned with what apps are collecting data about you, um, you may be more interested in like switching to a, a privacy preserving operating system like Calyx OS that you can run on your Android phone. Um, it definitely can vary a lot, but I, th I think probably a, a focusing on a privacy preserving browser or something like Firefox or Brave and then implementing um, some good plugins like uBlock Origin, Local CDN uh, can be a, a good start there. Um, as for cryptocurrency, it's also very tricky to give a broad kind of first recommendation there. Um, I guess the one that could apply to really basically any cryptocurrency is just not not sharing the amount of cryptocurrency you own and then not sharing addresses or transaction um, IDs for any way that you use cryptocurrency on like social media, on Reddit, anything like that. Um, trying to keep those out of those kind of uh, public very much surveilled uh, places just so there's not a, a clear link between a username or a um, id uh, and your on-chain activity um, that's probably a good cross-chain one outside of that it's start start to think more seriously about how you actually use cryptocurrency and using any privacy tools that are available to you on your favorite cryptocurrency or like if you are in bitcoin use samurai wallet i think it's the best privacy preserving way to use bitcoin um Obviously, as people can see from my picture, I'm I'm a huge fan of Monero, and I think it's a very, very important tool for financial privacy. Um, so if you want to be able to transact, you want to be able to do it privately, Monero is by far the simplest. Anyone can just pick it up and start using it and gain very strong levels of privacy. Um, so that was definitely more than one each, but I don't really know how to give <laughs> how to give one recommendation for general privacy in cryptocurrency. It's a tricky one. Okay, yeah, I think that was very useful, though, uh, Henry. What what do you want to say on this? Um, first, everything that Seth said about just general privacy is completely spot on. I think privacy looks very different for every single person. For some people, they can still use social media and consider themselves private because of how they use it and it fits their threat model. And for some people, um, that's not even an option for them. So having any social media just isn't private. Um, I think that Seth's recommendations of getting on a good browser and um, it is already just a great step forward. And I would say just take some some of the basic things like if you have Google as your default search engine, look into other private search engines. DuckDuckGo is out there. Brave Search has their own indexable search engine that they use for their own search results. Um, StartPage gives you Google results, but more privately. Um, I would also recommend looking into end-to-end -end encryption messengers. So if you are communicating That's with people, one. yeah, like it's one of the easiest things you can do, right? Uh, Signal is a great tool that you can use to just talk with friends and family. Um, you can use Matrix, you can use Session, really anything that has end-to-end -end encryption that's not from Facebook is ideally something that you should be using in your arsenal. Um, as for cryptocurrency, so just pure disclaimer, I'm coming more from the privacy end, but my main issue with cryptocurrency stuff is anything that has to do with exchanges. So um, I like to personally um, urge people to avoid exchanges that require KYC when they can. And also, um, if you are going to use an exchange that has KYC, don't keep your crypto in the exchange, especially if they don't give you your, uh, your seeds. Um, and I'm sure that's pretty common universal advice shared in the cryptocurrency community, but I think it should always be repeated. Yeah, quick, quick comment there. I mean, first, I can't believe I didn't say use no KYC exchanges. So you, you one up to me and I'm the one who's supposed to be more in cryptocurrency. Um, but just for people who, who aren't aware of what that term means, KYC is just short for know your customer. 
a lot of times it's also referred to along with AML, which stands for anti-money laundering. Um, and those are basically two types of regulation that force exchanges through various means to collect personally identifiable information, like your driver's license, a selfie of you holding your driver's license, um, your address, basically whatever information they can possibly collect about you, they are supposedly have to collect that to prevent money laundering and financial crimes. Um, but there's been lots of good research that shows that the, that type of regulation does very little to prevent financial crimes. And it has a massively harmful effect on the users because you're giving up all of your personal data to companies that are not professional cybersecurity companies. They often will pay as little as possible for good cybersecurity teams. And so your data can very easily be, be hacked and stolen from those, much less the government has access to all of that, which links you directly to all of your on-chain activity. So definitely avoiding KYC AML exchanges is a, a key, key thing. And really, no matter what cryptocurrency you're using after that, if you never acquire it with a KYC exchange, you're going to be much better off because you'll at least, in most cryptocurrencies, you'll at least have a, a level of pseudonymity at the very least uh, when using that cryptocurrency if you if you're not directly tying it to your, your ID. Thanks for expanding on that. Um, I Please hold me accountable for any jargon. Um, and just a cool resource that I found recently that I'm sure Seth is aware of and maybe some people here, there's a site called kycnot.me um, mm -hmm. and it shows you some pretty cool uh, non-KYC services that you can get started on. So now you're taking a step back, what is actually the situation of privacy in the cryptocurrency space right now? Are we doing a good job and it's just sort of crazy people in a corner that are just worried about privacy? Are, are there larger problems? How would you describe, you know, the information we share using cryptocurrencies and what your main concerns are? It's definitely more of a Seth question to get started on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can go and kick us off. Um, so I would say definitely overall, we are doing very, very poorly when it comes to to caring about privacy when using cryptocurrencies. Um, I think people have really gotten carried away with the speculative draw of cryptocurrencies and forgotten that these things, and I'm speaking generally, just kind of assume that I'm referring to like Bitcoin, Ethereum, kind of the key, the key cryptocurrencies that people would be using. Um, so that I'm sure there are some out there that this doesn't apply to, and a lot of this won't apply to Monero, um, but assume I'm talking about those, but generally we've done a very bad job uh, because we've gotten caught up in kind of the number go up um, idea of I want to make money and I don't really care about anything else. Um, and we've also combined that with uh, the the constant pressure from social media and from um, the way that society really is now to be sharing everything about you constantly. So we have this this pressure to make money on cryptocurrency. We have this pressure to share about what we're doing and how we're making money constantly on social media and other platforms. And that really combines into making it very, very, uh, just it makes a very dangerous environment when using something that hopefully people realize is normally transparent by default. So like Bitcoin, Ethereum, there is no privacy provided by default, um, is generally like again, talking about Bitcoin Ethereum, it's something that those transactions will live on the blockchain forever. So whatever you do today may be fine today, but if that transaction is directly linked to your ID in the future or in the past, and someone decides that you shouldn't have done that in the future, they can always go back and look up that transaction on the Ethereum blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain, et cetera. Um, so combining kind of the the way that society doesn't care about privacy and a permanent blockchain that will in theory last for at least many years and potentially forever. Um, we kind of make this nightmare scenario for surveillance. And it's, it's something that um, I don't know if many people are familiar with the term panopticon, but it's just kind of this concept that, that you can be watched so much that you just start to change the way that you behave because you're being watched all the time um, and using a cryptocurrency that doesn't provide privacy really enables governments to be able to do that. It uh, enables um, exchanges to be able to do that. But it's really just a situation where even though there have not been broadly detrimental things because of a lack of privacy in cryptocurrency so far, um, the combination of kind of the, the non caring about privacy attitude and blockchains lasting forever, I think will will cause a lot of heartache and a lot of really rough situations down the line. Um, so I definitely think it's it's not ideal as it is today. There are definitely people doing very, very good work, uh, both research and implementation in the cryptocurrency space. Um, there's some 
some great stuff on Bitcoin. Obviously, I mentioned Samurai Wallet. Um, Wasabi Wallet has been doing some work on on privacy in Bitcoin. Um, Join Market is another approach. All three of those tools are, are coin join tools, which help to kind of obfuscate the origins of a transaction. Um, there's some interesting work on Ethereum, like Tornado Cash and um, a few other tools that provide privacy if you use them properly. And the same thing applies with Bitcoin. They can provide privacy if used properly. Um, and then kind of the really the leader in the space and by far the most used cryptocurrency that is privacy preserving in nature is Monero. Um, and obviously in the Monero community, we're hyper focused on building digital cash is kind of a good way to sum it up. And just focusing on that 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 realization that privacy matters. This is a permanent blockchain. It's something that has to be publicly verifiable, but we still want to maintain privacy as much as possible. Um, so I'm hopeful that that attitude will continue to spread. It's definitely something that it needs community traction to get dev support, to get um, integration into layer ones like Bitcoin and Ethereum. So if there are enough people clamoring for privacy tools, they're going to get built and they're going to work well. Um, so I'm hopeful that more people will kind of wake up and realize that need. Uh, but I think we are definitely in a kind of a dangerous place right now in, in not caring about privacy when using cryptocurrencies. What's the actual impact of that though? Like someone might sit there and they're like, well, I sure I just buy, I, I go to Coinbase, I buy Bitcoin. And let's say I'm even trying to be a professional. I've heard that I get extra credit points if I withdraw them from Coinbase and put them in my own wallet. So I do that. And wow, look at me, I'm an expert. I held, hold my own keys, right? Um, what's the impact for that user, the fact that they're transacting and not really using any privacy features um, when they're just using cryptocurrencies just even if they're not, you know, going to a dark net market, let's say, let's say they're just sending money back and forth between their friends using Bitcoin um, through their own non custodial wallet. What, what are the like, why should people be or have some pause before they just do that pretty mindlessly? Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a, a few concerns. Um, I think the simplest one, and it's something that we've all probably done in our time in cryptocurrency is someone sends you some money, or they post a transaction ID or address on Twitter or whatever, you go look it up and you get to see how much money they have, where they're spending funds, what they've bought, what they've sold. Um, on Ethereum, you can get a lot of details about the swaps that they're doing if using like decentralized exchanges, that kind of thing. Um, so at the very least, you're revealing a lot of your financial information to anyone that you're transacting with. Um, so if that is just friends and family, at worst, I mean, yeah, and in, in theory, at worst, in that situation, they know how much money you've spent on cryptocurrency and maybe how much money you've lost trying to YOLO into into Doge on some exchange <laughs> they or something. They would know what NFTs you bought. They what would. They would know what NFTs you bought. That is definitely a definitely a, a dangerous situation to be in. Um, so that I mean, it's kind of like a best case scenario, really, is if you're just transacting with friends and family. Um, the, I guess, kind of the next level of concern would be if you're sharing like transaction IDs, addresses, if you're sending money to people you don't know and revealing all of that financial information. Um, if you reveal, for instance, you make a Bitcoin transaction to someone just uh, paying back for lunch. So you're not someone you know well, you just met them at a, a party or something, you got lunch, you send them some money and they get to see, oh, you have $100,000 in Bitcoin sitting in uh, your account. And he can clearly link that back to you. Maybe he has a friend and they come and they beat you up, they steal it. Maybe they force you to give him your ledger and give your password. Like there are a lot of situations where you could just expose information about you that if the person didn't know, they would never have wanted to try to do that. But once they know exactly how much money you have, they could try to do something like that to, to steal it. Um, I think from there, the next level up would be when you've directly tied your ID to your cryptocurrency accounts and the ways that you use cryptocurrency. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the, the things that you're doing now may be fine. Um, and owning Bitcoin, owning Ethereum, those kinds of things, those may be fine today, uh, but that can rapidly change. I mean, we've seen throughout world history, governments can flip very quickly into authoritarian governments um, and into uh, governments that will persecute minorities, persecute religious minorities, racial minorities, lots of different things that can go wrong. And just having your ID linked to those cryptocurrencies um, could maybe just be something where the government seizes all of Bitcoin from people who they know have Bitcoin. Um, it could be something where you get thrown in jail because you were transacting with someone who was deemed uh, a, a danger to the state. Um, there have been many cases where people have donated money to someone who's um, deemed to be 
dangerous or someone who has uh, political or religious beliefs that are, are not kind of approved of by the state and they get in trouble just because they donated money to someone, um, even though they didn't do anything technically wrong or illegal, it's easily traced back to them. Um, so those are some of them. I mean, there's there's really just growing risks and these things are only getting worse and worse as we don't care about privacy and as cryptocurrencies become more standard um, and become more normal throughout life and as we start to use them more and more. Um, so those are some of them. I'm sure I missed plenty. Um, there is a lot of risk, but um, yeah, that's those are definitely the key ones, I think. Um, just to add to that, I think that it's an interesting question because I think a lot of people in the cryptocurrency world either believe or want to see cryptocurrencies used more day to day. They want adoption rates to, to increase. Mm -hmm. And what I would, so what I would pretty much come back to that question with is if we do see cryptocurrency being adopted day to day as just your normal payment methods, then this question really isn't cryptocurrency specific. The question is just why do we care about financial privacy to begin with. And the reality is that um, your, your bank statements aren't just shared with the public. You don't just go to your employer and say, here's where I spent the money that you paid me this month. Um, in the current day and age with many cryptocurrencies, that is the reality. So I do think that um, it's just an important question to think about and just how you normally live your day-to-day -day life right now. Um, and the fact that you do have a cash option to pay for something privately if you want to get something from a store and not have it tied to you. Um, just having those options available. And then that's just another thing to add on to everything that Seth said that I think was absolutely perfect. Yeah, I yeah. Think that's well, a great point. One thing, like one example for me personally that sort of scares me <laughs> with the transparency. Suppose I donated myself money to the Trevor Project, which is you know an LGBT-friendly, supportive group. And then I went to a country and made a payment with the same address or some linkage of addresses in the country that wasn't supportive of LGBT rights, like that could get pretty bad pretty quickly. Um, so it's, it, there's no reason that needed to have been recorded on a public blockchain. So it, it kind of scares me and there could be real implications to some real people. Um, I'm going to switch topics a little bit real fast. So um, what are some of the coolest privacy developments that you're seeing in the space? I'm going to split this actually in half. So first, I'm going to go to Henry. Can you talk about one that is outside of cryptocurrency, something that you know, in the privacy space really, really excites you that people are working on and then for Seth, something in the cryptocurrency space. Um, is it okay if I do two? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, the first one, I'm a huge fan, huge fan of the recent move to email aliasing. I just learned about Simple Login probably like a year ago. And then I also learned about Anon Addy. And then um, Mozilla has kind of their half-baked limited to five alias feature, which actually just recently now you can pay for more, which is awesome. Um, Apple has it now. Pretty much everyone is moving over to email aliases, which is just a dramatic, dramatic move forward for email. Because now you don't just have a single email that gets leaked in a data breach, and you can actually have different emails for each different service so that it really helps contain data breaches. And I hope that this idea gets expanded into other things down the road, like phone numbers and whatnot. Um, but I just think it's a great starting point. Um, email aliasing, I think, is just a relatively new-ish thing for a lot of people, and it's really starting to blow up. Um, the second thing that I'm a really big fan of that I want to be the future, though I'm still very critical of it, um, is Linux phones. I know that um, there's lots of issues that they have to go through. I don't see it being a actual mainstream device that you can use for most things in the next even five years or more. But I do think that um, it'd be really great to have an alternative to Linux and Android down, or to um, iOS and Android down the road. Um, and just full disclosure, I am 100% happy on my current Android device with Calyx OS. 100% happy, but just seeing that privacy development on the Linux end of things would also be fantastic. Yeah, that the email aliasing was something that I actually learned from you in in the first episode of Opt Out when we chatted about that, and you you mentioned that as kind of one of your favorite tools. And I I'd never even heard of the concept, much less simple login and how simple they made it. Um, it's so great. it's a yeah, it's it's an incredible tool, super super useful. Like you mentioned, you give a a unique address to every different service you sign up to. Um, super easy to make them. And then, like you said, if you if you're 
data is leaked in some sort of breach, all they get is that email alias. And if that's being used to like target you with spam or whatever, you just disable the alias and you call it a day. You don't have to switch email addresses. You don't have to go through any struggles. You just disable the alias and, and move on. So that's been one of the kind of simplest but most useful tools that I've I've been turned on to lately as well. Um, super, super cool concept and something that is growing in popularity. Yep, it's also free and open source. So mm -hmm. I think you get 15 aliases free, which I don't even think I use more than 15. So um, I would definitely try out Simple Login. It's completely free and open source. And you can self-host it too, for those of you who really wanted to go all out. Man, 15 aliases. I don't know how you live with that few. I think I've got yeah, like I was thinking 70 or something now. <laughs> oh, man. <Yeah. laughs> they grow quickly. I mean, think, think about how many entries you have in your KeePass database, right? It's more than 15. <laughs> well, I, one, I don't have very many accounts, so that's actually getting close to like, the number of accounts I own. But um, I also group them up um, a little bit, so I don't use one for each entry. Oh, is that like the Jedi meme where people on one side are like, I don't have enough failing, like, uh, sorry, like 15 is enough for me because I don't use many. And then in the middle of the Jedi meme, you're like, uh, you know, oh, I need a thousand. But if you're the Jedi in the fall, right, then you have so few accounts and 15 accounts for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> So I think uh, on the cryptocurrency side, um, a development around privacy, I, I really think, and it's one that's not necessarily directly a privacy tool, um, but one of the coolest ones that's been happening lately has been kind of finally the realization of atomic swaps as a, a tool to move in and out of different cryptocurrencies easily, seamlessly, and without trust, which is by far the biggest piece. Um, and atomic swaps are an important tool for privacy because they enable you to uh, jump between cryptocurrencies without having to use a centralized exchange that has KYC or that has to follow those regulations, that has to surveil you or keep an eye on what you're doing. Um, so it gives a lot of frictionless ways to move between cryptocurrencies, which really help every cryptocurrency user um, because you can much more easily use whatever cryptocurrency you prefer. And then like... Um, the specific atomic swaps I'm talking about are, are Bitcoin to Monero have been kind of the, the main driver lately for atomic swaps. Um, and that enables, for instance, Bitcoin users, when they want to make a payment, they can just swap some of their Bitcoin into Monero and then make the payment and not have to worry nearly as much about privacy. Um, they can know that Monero is going to provide them very strong privacy guarantees without having to jump through any extra hoops. So they just atomic swap some into that. You can kind of think of it like moving from your savings account to your checking account. Um, and then they can spin the Monero and it's much, much simpler to do that. And they don't have to trust some central exchange. They don't have to trust a custodial swap service. Because when you do an atomic swap, you either swap the funds and get what you wanted or the swap fails and you get your original funds back minus the fees. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful tool that has been talked about for many years, but is kind of finally coming to fruition. Um, and I think that'll really open up people being able to stay to keep using the cryptocurrency that they prefer. If you're like an Ethereum fan, if you're a Bitcoin fan, um, whatever you love and you use mainly, but you want to be able to preserve privacy when you're maybe making payments, you can quickly swap into something else to make that payment. Or if you love a merchant, but for instance, they only accept Bitcoin and you have Monero, you can swap from your Monero into Bitcoin without having, again, to go through a central exchange or give up personally identifiable information. You can make that swap call it a day, not have to worry about the other person on the other side being malicious or dangerous, um, and then you can spend as you need to. Uh, so I think that's that's probably one of the exciting tools. It's not like necessarily a privacy tool, but it has broad privacy implications because we can cut out the kind of the on and off ramps that are the, the most tightly surveilled parts of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So not Very lightning, cool. no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not yet. There's definitely some promise. I'm not a huge Lightning fan, but there's definitely some promise. There are a lot of brilliant people working on it, um, and it does provide some better privacy guarantees than like base chain uh, Bitcoin. Uh, but I am definitely curious to see how Layer 2 networks in general kind of push towards privacy moving forward. Um, how does atomic how do how do atomic swaps compare to something like SideShift? Like, what what's the core advantage there? So really the the core advantage there is that it's it's similar in how you would use it and that you um, put in uh, the address you want to send funds to, you put in the amount you want to swap, and you send, say, Bitcoin and, and swap it for Monero. Um, it's similar in the kind of the way you experience it. 
But the key difference is on the back end, instead of you sending Bitcoin into their wallet that they have control of, and then them hopefully making the swap into Monero, and then them sending Monero from the wallet that they control into your wallet, uh, which if that all goes seamlessly, that's a, a great tool. And those are like sideshift.ai, uh, fixfloat.com. Those are some great instant exchangers that are custodial. So there is risk that they would steal your funds and not give you what you want, but they have good reputation for the moment. Um, the difference between those and atomic swaps is, I guess, twofold. The, the first one is that in atomic swaps, there's only one party that can surveil what's happening in the swap. So only one party knows exactly what's happened and exactly what the swap has done. Um, in most cases, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, there's no kind of central company or something that could log all of those transactions and could try to use that to um, either sell that data to someone else or a government to surveil people who are swapping through them, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other, and really the key advantage, that's the technological advantage in atomic swaps, is that you don't have to trust the other person. They never have custody of your funds and you never have custody of their funds. Um, so when you start the atomic swap, essentially what happens is you you go through some cryptography magic to, to sign and both of you basically promise to go through with the swap or to fail back and refund the transaction. And the way that the atomic swap is designed is that you'll send funds. If maybe you're on the Bitcoin side, they're on the Monero side. You send funds, they get locked. The Monero user locks their funds, both of you in a way that's provable and that you can send back and forth to each other to prove that you've locked those funds. And then if the transaction goes through, if everyone does what they're supposed to, your Bitcoin will be sent to them and they can claim the Bitcoin with the messages that you've sent back and forth. And then you'll be able to claim the Monero that they sent to you. And if it fails, you'll automatically broadcast some refund and cancellation transactions that will handle getting everyone's money back to them. Um, there are some slight exceptions, but there's no way that the other person can just take your money. As long as you're online and doing the swap, um, you'll either get the other asset that you wanted or you'll get back your original funds. That's super cool. Um, you have uh, resources on your site to get that set up, right? Yeah, so there's uh, there are definitely other atomic swaps outside of Bitcoin to Monero, uh, but they are much, uh, I think they're still relatively new. Um, my focus has been on Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps, and so I have some information on um, blog.sethforprivacy.com uh, and under the guides there that, that walk you through how to do an atomic swap with the, the only current mainnet Bitcoin to Monero atomic swap technology and it'll walk you through exactly how to go and do that swap so if you want to just test it or if you have been wanting to swap some bitcoin for monero or vice versa i have guides to do both of those um and then there's also a, a new bitcoin to monero atomic swap that just started or that just had a public release today actually um, that's testnet only but it's something that i've been testing out um you can see my thread on twitter at seth for privacy uh, and get some information on that but that's basically another and more detailed approach that'll be really good building blocks for not only Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps, but um, a lot of other cross-chain atomic swaps. So very exciting stuff. Very cool. Um, I have one last question for you both, and then I'm going to ask for people to be invited to stage to you know, ask their typical Q&A type question uh, so that they can they can address you directly. So if you want to do that, raise your hand and we can invite you on the stage right after. Um, but in your opinions, what is one privacy discussion that you're just so tired about hearing over and over and over again? I'll let you go first, Henry. I'm gonna need a sec, because there's a few. Um, so if you already have one, you can go ahead. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's a privacy discussion, but I think the the most frustrating thing that I run into in the privacy space is that people who have realized the need for personal privacy and who are conscious about that, there's kind of an overwhelming thing you have to fight through as you're trying to take back your personal privacy, which is that people just want the perfect tool for every situation but they want the perfect tool for them. And everybody has a very specific threat model. Everybody has very specific things that they want to keep private. Um, everyone has very specific ways that they want to start out. So there, there's very much not a one size fits all thing in privacy. Um, there is not the perfect browser for everyone. There is not the perfect phone for everyone. Um, so I think probably the, the biggest frustration when kind of walking through privacy with people is that the newcomers are often kind of just beat over the head with, 
okay, yeah, you're using Signal, but Signal's awful because they require a phone number. So you should be using Session or you should be using these. And like they they get basically beat up over using what is a good privacy solution, but maybe not the one that the person they're talking to thinks is the ideal privacy solution. Um, so that may be a maybe a big one for me. I mean, the other one that, that gets really annoying is kind of the browser wars where everybody fights over which, which browser is best and everybody has their favorites. Um, but that's probably it for me. Funny because the two things that I was thinking about were browser wars, <laughs> messenger wars. Shouldn't have let me go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it, it kind of extends into both into what you said. I think that ultimately the reason for browser wars and messenger wars is because people aren't taking into consideration other people's needs, right? Like that ultimately is why these wars are happening. It's like, no, what I'm using is better because of X, Y, Z. Therefore, since you're not using this, you're actually at a worse point than I would have been if I was to use it. It's just endless BS, to be honest, of just, uh, it, it really gets frustrating. Um, so pretty much, I think, just to sum up what, what Seth said and to maybe add a little bit to it, use the tools that work best for you. You're not going to get perfect privacy. If anyone claims they have perfect privacy, they're lying to you because they're probably talking to you on a platform that probably has some inherent privacy risk. Um, and so nothing is perfect. So make sure to threat model, make sure to pick tools that actually work best for you and also make sure to value your time. I think that's something else. It's really easy to chase after um, absolute anonymity in one aspect of your life and then leave something else completely um, insecure. This is, this is the person who's using Tor browser for everything, but doesn't have 2FA set up for basic security on their account. And you know what, if that's what your threat model calls for, then sure. But I'm sure a lot of people might be making those decisions that might not be helping them in the long run because you have limited time and energy. So make sure you really dedicate time to the right things in the privacy world instead of getting hung up on the small 2% differences that people spend every day arguing over. Yeah, yeah, it's really just so important that you you start thinking about how privacy affects you, about how data hacks affect you, about how all of the things that are shared on social media, about how the apps that track you affect you, and just start to take some steps that are actionable for you, that make sense to you, um, and that are, are good privacy wins. Don't worry about finding the perfect tool right away or worry about kind of tackling everything at once, but really just kind of figure out what's, what's a first step that I can start at, work on that, find a good tool that fits your specific needs, that fits your view of a threat model at the time. Your threat model will change over time. Um, but just really find find the thing that you can jump into that you understand and that'll be a, a useful tool for you and uh, just run with it. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure people understand the pain of the stupid browser conversation because people will <laughs> literally, every single day, without fail, they will just argue for hours. It's like the same people. It's like, do you have a job? What are you doing? And they're, just, they're sitting there just arguing about why someone should use Tor or browser or why someone should use Firefox or why someone should use Brave. It's literally this, always the same three unless you have some wacko person that happens to also show up. But like, that is just... That's the face of the community and the privacy side for a lot of people. They just go in the rooms, they see people like cussing each other out about why, you know, if you're not using Tor, you're a terrible person or whatever. <laughs> like that's that's sometimes how it is. Anyway, I just I just wanted to make sure that those who were not in these rooms all the time just got a little taste of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a total turnoff too. If you're if you're someone who just learned about privacy and it's like, oh my gosh, I've been woken up. Let's see what this is all about. And they're like, wow, these people are kind of kind of toxic. Uh, maybe maybe it's kind of a red flag, and I should just avoid this. <laughs> um. Yeah, those, those are, right. yeah, go ahead. No, I, I'm trying to invite people on stage. There's some, I, think, I don't know if it's a display bug or what, but there's a display bug on both my it. phone. Okay, so I'm the only one on stage as far as I can tell. Yep, um, I have the same problem. Okay, so blame Reddit. So I invited someone else to stage. If you are on stage, please say hi. Okay. So now I'm going to do the dangerous thing where I'm just going to start inviting other people on stage and just hope that they are good hearted and they're good people. So, and I also hope that they actually do get up on stage. So, oh, there we go. Turbo Daisy, congratulations. You actually visibly showed up on their stage. Welcome, Turbo Daisy. How are you? Okay, 
Yeah, they may. They might be a little bit shy. I just also be muted. I did not realize it. Is there a message function? Or... I, uh... Oh! oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, okay. This is my first time. Uh, yeah. No, you never truly know if people are departed, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, did you have a question about privacy? I do. Um, I... The thing is, I've documented a lot of my presence, and it's also like I can't take it back. And I'll, the thing is, I have such uh, like little knowledge about privacy, and I don't know. I want to, yeah. Yeah, I I think it's. Uh, I'll just go ahead and jump in. If do you have more? Where it's kind of for me, it's overwhelming. I don't know where to begin. Like, where's the step? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's that's like a super, super common feeling. And I mean, everyone kind of starts out with that idea of like, I've been not caring about privacy for so long. Like, is it worth it to go ahead and start caring now? Because it really does feel overwhelming to start to kind of take back all of the things that you've been doing, the ways that you've been sharing information, or all of the apps that you've been using, or whatever but i think i mean the, the most important thing is that like you're you're here and you're obviously interested and you're starting to to think about and process like how can privacy affect me and how can a lack of privacy affect me um so i first off just want to say like that's great that you're you're thinking seriously about that now um past that i think like uh, some of what we talked about earlier with just just like start with one thing um like maybe if you're messaging everyone in maybe like facebook messenger or something like that um, something that's that's not private and that's that's surveilled. Maybe just try to switch over to using something like Signal, um, which is just a, it's an open source uh, messaging app. It's it's private, but you don't really even need to worry about that. It's just a nice messaging app that works really well, while at the same time protecting your privacy. Um, so maybe that's a first step. It could also be something like uh, we talked about with uh, just kind of starting to to think more about your your browser and the way that you use that. Starting to use some plugins, um, but it very much will be specific to specific to you, but definitely don't get overwhelmed to know that everyone starts in that place of like, I want to care about privacy, but I've just never thought about it. So it feels overwhelming to start to, to concern myself with that. Um, but really just like kudos to you for, for starting to think about it, for coming up, asking a question and jumping into that. And, and that's really the most important first step. Um, and after that, it's just kind of finding the, another step that you can take towards that. And then really finding some community around you that can help you to walk through that. Um, so if you don't, if you don't have that in like in real life, there's some great communities online, like, uh, Henry from TechLore, who's the other one who's speaking up here. Um, he has a great community on matrix and discord, I think too. Right. Henry. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that would be a great place for you to just jump in and start asking some questions, uh, and just get some, get some good info from people and just get some support and encouragement from people who can just kind of help you as you start to walk through, uh, what your personal privacy will look like. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, just to add on to that too, I think everything you said was was fantastic, Seth. Um, just to add on to it, everything Seth said, you can start today or next week or next month, and everything he said is past and future. I think what really overwhelms people is the idea of the past, and something to really help with that is it is completely in the past. Um, so you're not going to be in a worse situation from here. So I think a very important thing is coming to terms with the fact that that happened. Um, but also it is possible to remove a good portion of the past online. Um, I know that's kind of a misconception. You might not get a hundred percent, but you're able to go back and delete accounts. You're able to clean up privacy settings. You're able to delete posts. Um, it's very unlikely that people are, you know, documenting things publicly on your past self. Um, my best recommendation for you is to get a password manager and load every account you have into the password manager and start organizing it so that you can start seeing all the accounts you have. Because I think a lot of the feelings of being overwhelmed, which are completely natural, by the way, come from a lack of understanding of what's going on. So, and I think a password manager is a great way to kind of organize yourself and figure out where you're at so that you can um, proceed from there. That's something that I find helps a lot of people in the get started steps on top of everything that Seth said. Yeah, no, I, um, <laughs> you know, you kind of, you kind of hear about, um, 
VPN and password manager. And it's kind of like, I've been so conflicted because I'm calm when it comes to convenience and privacy. It's like I secretly enjoy targeted ads because they know <laughs> its <laughs> algorithm works. And then I'm like, so conflicted because uh, I'm kind of giving into it, I feel like. Especially when it's, I don't know, convenience, like in privacy. Uh, on, but also when it comes to internet security, I, I have, <laughs> I, I feel so exposed, like my door is open because I have, I don't know, I don't have shields, which I should. Um, but yeah, so uh, matrix, uh, and password manager, what was the, um, <coughs> signal you said? It's like, uh, yeah, signal is a super easy to use messaging app. That's what I use with like friends and family. I've gotten all my all my family pulled in. Just a it's a nice chat app that also provides you strong strong privacy. So no one can see who what you're messaging or who you're messaging except for you and the person you're talking to. So it's just a super easy thing to transition to. Start with just like close friends. Try to get them on board and and go with that. Um, but there may be other things that are more important to you. So it, it does really come down to like what's important to you. But I think like Henry mentioned too, another tool if you're worried more about maybe security is a password manager is a great tool for for starting to just kind of secure some of your accounts, not use the same password across all of your accounts, that kind of thing. Um, and that can be helpful on the on the security side. There's a really good password manager called Bitwarden, B-I-T-W-A-R-D-E-N. Um, that's yeah, what I use, a lot of people too. use. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great solution. It's free. Um, it has an app on every platform, so you can have it on your phone, on your on your computer. There's a browser extension that'll just autofill username and password that you save in there. On websites, it's it's very easy to use and, and a great kind of starter on the security side specifically. Henry, do you want to quickly talk about the video you put out this week on threat modeling too? Um, yeah, it's uh definitely it definitely plays into this a little bit. Um, the video that we put out this week on the TechLore YouTube channel, it's also on YouTube and Odyssey, was about threat modeling, which is essentially figuring out what you want to protect. And in a situation like you, you might realize I'm fine with targeted advertisements, right? We're not here to tell you what you're okay and not okay with. If you're fine with targeted advertisements and you don't have any ethical issues with it, and you're fine with that in your privacy journey, you can still have that but want security. So maybe you're fine with that data being in the hands of a select few, um, but you want that data secure. And so that would be something that would be more of a security tool, which is why Seth called the password manager something good for security. Um, but it also can be good for privacy in some ways or another. Um, there's also anonymity, and anonymity would be using something like the Tor browser. Um, it, there's really, I, I think the three main terms are security, privacy, and anonymity, which uh, definitely are their own exclusive ideas, but they can really work off each other very well sometimes. So I think that a really good starting point is defining what the things are you're trying to protect against too. And so if you're interested in that, um, we put out that video. The EFF has a threat modeling guide on their website that really helps you figure out, you know, what you're trying to protect in your life and really figure out what to do from, from the get-go. And it can another thing, that can save you so much time down the road. Um, as someone who's gone to like the extreme depths and then had to dial everything back, I could have saved so much time if I just sat down and spent an hour working on a threat model and a game plan. Just like anything in life, planning is really important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Turbo Daisy, for coming on stage. I also want to yeah. allow big investor you to, uh, to to say hi and ask questions if you, if you have them. Hey, guys. How are you? Thank you for that. Thank you for this chat. It was wonderful. Um, in, in the note to privacy, I I just got into investing probably about a year ago. I, my name's a joke. But over the course of the year, I just began to get into cryptos. And I understand like the case for privacy, especially more so now than than before. Uh, when it comes to tracking, as as you were mentioning before, um, you can track someone pretty much easy. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, oh. we can. Okay, cool. So, in the way I understand it is, you can track someone very easily, habitually, for where they spend their money. And in the case with like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, currencies like that, if you're spending it in a certain location, you can see where you know, someone's pos potentially going to be. So I understand is that to be like a threat as potential, you know, harm to somebody. Now, 
in a case where like Monero, Zcash, and I don't see them being, I want to see them being adopted, but I don't see them being, how do you, how do you say it? Um, scalable. I just don't see it from, from my understanding, if, if I'm wrong here, is that one, like Monero is more so of like a payment, a fungible token one or cryptocurrency that is just, that is that what it is? Just a currency payment method. One is one um, indistinguishable, unlike Bitcoin. From my understanding, Bitcoin has a traceability. Monero is different. So you, can, you can't track where it goes. It's just it's one token. And aside from Zcash, where you have the privacy, but you have the ability to also be open as well. And from my perspective is that institutionals, institutional bankers or the investment banking want to get into something where they, they have that, that option to show where, where the money is coming from. So well, my question is this. In the case where cryptocurrencies do get, you know, like these, these type of cryptocurrencies, these private ones get adapted, adopted, should I say, how, how do we, how do they scale? How do they become more than just, you know, a form of, I mean, sorry, I'm all over the place here. I see Monero and Zcash as a opposite side of gold as like silver to Bitcoin. Maybe I'm wrong as a store of value. But in a sense, we're like, it's your money and nobody's supposed to know about it. So I, can, I, I think I understand what you're asking. It seems like there's a couple pieces in that, like, can something like, no, 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 you're good. I think kind of the, I'll try to kind of rephrase the two questions. One, I think is, can Monero, I'll, I'll just focus on Monero, because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, some of the things that I'll say about Monero can apply to Zcash, but I'll focus on Monero. That's the one so I focus like, mostly on too as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one question was kind of can Monero scale for payments? Like can enough people use it for it to be kind of a powerful tool? And then your second question I think was can Monero or those kinds of things also be a good investment as a store of value? Was that a good summary? Yes. Okay. Um, so for the first one, uh, I'll also just say before I get into this full disclaimer, I'm not, in cryptocurrency for investments like that is definitely a, a huge aspect of them and that's why most people are in cryptocurrency they're here to speculate and make money which is a, a great part of the incentives that are in cryptocurrencies so there's no problem with that but that's not my focus so i'll just make that clear but um for scalable payments i think to me the most important thing is what is a tool that works for you today and monero is a tool that works very well for payments that are private that are cheap and you can use it today. Um, so I'm really focused on what is a tool that people can use and that can support all of the people that I know who want to use it today. Um, and Monero is very much that. Um, as far as scaling to like, I don't know if you've heard the term like hyper Bitcoinization or just kind of this idea that like a cryptocurrency will be used everywhere. Um, I don't really think that will happen. If it did, Monero has certain aspects of it that can help it to, to scale drastically uh, like it has a dynamic block size and all this is going to get pretty technical but um it has functions that are built in that help it scale and it's actually and i i started kind of writing about cryptocurrencies because of this but it, it's actually the most efficient privacy cryptocurrency out there it's more efficient than bitcoin use privacy it's privately it's more efficient than zcash use privately um so it's actually quite scalable and, and would work quite well at, at large, large scale, far higher than we're using now, far higher than um, Bitcoin's being used now. So there's definitely a lot of headroom for for scaling there. Um, as for the second question for store of value, I, I think really it, it can be an excellent store of value. It has been over time. It's done well. Um, obviously, like against Bitcoin over the last couple of years, it hasn't done as well as if you had just held Bitcoin, but things come and go. Um, but the the key to me with any cryptocurrency is I don't want to reveal the thing that I'm storing value in or the way that I'm making payments to people unless I choose to reveal that information. Um, so okay. some way to preserve my privacy is important to me in my store of value as well. So like if you're using Bitcoin as a store of value and you choose to go that route, which totally makes sense and I understand that, using something like Samurai Wallet to, to obfuscate where you got the funds and where they go next, I think is really important. So privacy is is to me extremely important in a store of value. 
Um, just like gold, if you have gold and you have it in your house, no one knows how much gold you have or when you got it or where it's going or anything like that. Um, so I think privacy is, is very important for a store of value as well. So from an investment perspective, I don't think those things are definitely are incompatible. Um, but I, I also, I'm, I'm not really here for investment. So that's not really the area where, where I focus. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm inviting people on stage. Uh, we have a few more minutes. We're not going to go on for much, much longer. But if you want to ask more questions of Seth and Henry, raise your hand. I'll get you on stage, and you can ask them. Uh, welcome to the stage, uh, Scuba Monster. What, what, what brings you up, and what questions do you have? You're you're muted. Give you another second to try and uh, sort that out if you if you want to ask a question. I don't see any other raised hands though, so you all are shy. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Now we can. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I just want to add on to the uh, Monero side of uh, financial privacy. Um, the Monero has uh, view keys, so even though you, it's a great personal privacy um, coin, you can use view keys to legitimize business um, payments and receiving payments. So I think that's another great feature of Monero to be a legitimate um, business uh, currency. That's all I just wanted to add. Yeah, yeah, it's a super important point that you can choose to opt out of the privacy if you want. Um, and there are definitely valid reasons why you would do that. There are definitely times when you want to reveal the the payments that you made or like, for instance, if you're accepting donations in Monero, uh, it's pretty common practice to publish the view key so that people can see when donations come in or can see when you spend donations if you publish key images specifically. But that's a it's a definitely a valuable thing and you need to be able to choose to opt out of the privacy. But yeah, the important thing in Monero is that you're you're automatically getting privacy and then you can just choose to reveal whatever you want to the world. Yes, that's right. Having that default privacy is essential where like things like Zcash or Dash, it's actually um, opt-in privacy as opposed to opt-out privacy. And that those two distinctions are very important. I think people need to understand the difference of those two. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Thank you. That's it. Okay, so since I don't have any other people raising their hands with questions, I'm just going to quickly step back. I have, Seth, I don't know how prepared you are for this one. Henry, also, I'm not sure either. Um, but there's been a lot of talk about ZK rollups or other some sort of, you know, quote unquote, zero knowledge proving systems. And I can, you know, I'll quickly talk about those in a second. But there's been actually a lot of money, a lot of projects that have committed to the idea, of whether it's on Ethereum, on you know, usually it's Ethereum, but just some blockchain where they want to have some more private system built on top of it. I think people are going to see a lot of those coming out in the next year. Coinbase just put out a video earlier this week, for example, on these, these new systems. And so I want to very quickly say that just because you hear the phrase zero knowledge proof, that does not necessarily mean strong privacy. It's a cryptographic term. It's not a what privacy protections you actually get from the systems term or certification or anything like that. Um, but instead of asking specifically, like, I mean, if, if you do have ones that you're paying attention to in particular, definitely let people know. Uh, but instead of putting you on the spot that way, what um, what sort of things do you evaluate or do you look for when you're looking at these uh, new protocols, new projects that come out, try to build privacy on some existing layer, let's say. Um, what do you look for to see if it's if it's interesting in your mind, if it's something that, uh, you know, what do you look for to see if it's actually adopted or, or something you would want to do a lot more research into to figure out if it's something you want to start recommending or not? Yeah, I can go ahead and start. I'm, I'm really curious to hear Henry's perspective as someone who's like not cryptocurrency native like hasn't come through cryptocurrency but accepts cryptocurrency for payments and so i'm definitely i'm curious to hear his thoughts around that um 
I think from my perspective, the, the main thing that I keep in mind when I'm, I'm tr trying to evaluate how a cryptocurrency or a, a layer two network or a project on built on top of cryptocurrency, like an application like Samurai Wallet or something like that, when I'm trying to evaluate how it approaches privacy, um, I think there's two kind of key aspects that I look at. The, the first one is just really, can I use this tool effectively um, to, to gain privacy? And it's hard to answer that question unless you have kind of a deep understanding of how cryptocurrency privacy works. Um, so that's a hard question for kind of someone who's not familiar with the details of kind of the nitty gritty of how blockchains and how uh, cryptocurrency payments work and, and all of those pieces. So that one can be tricky to learn more about. Um, if it's not something you're familiar with, I definitely recommend you you try to to dig in. There's lots of good people on, on Twitter to follow. Um, there are some good uh, blogs out there on the topic. Um, I think Samurai Wallet went through a kind of a long series on talking about how privacy on Bitcoin works and how um, not using privacy on Bitcoin looks and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that that's probably a helpful resource. But I try to look at it first, kind of like how how can I use this tool? Can I use it successfully to protect my own privacy when when making payments um, or when using it? Like if I'm using Ethereum and using a decentralized exchange, can I make sure that this isn't linked back to my actual ID or even to like my my pseudonym or my my Twitter handle? I don't want any of that being linked to my public persona. Um, and then the second big piece that I evaluate, and this is really this is really key to me because my focus in interactions in the space is trying to help other people approach cryptocurrency with a, a, a mindset towards privacy. So the, the second point and kind of a key one for me is really thinking about can practically anyone use this privacy tool properly to gain solid privacy? And that one's very tricky to answer for basically every project out there and basically every tool out there. Um, most of them are not very user-friendly. Most of them have very uh, tricky kind of, <laughs> I kind of term them foot guns, um, but just kind of ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot when using them that that destroy the privacy that you're trying to gain. Um, like, I'll just give a, a couple examples. One would be Tornado Cash, which is kind of the well-known privacy tool that's a smart contract built on top of Ethereum. Um, and it it does provide privacy if you go from your wallet into Tornado Cash. And then when you withdraw, you withdraw to at least a new wallet, but hopefully multiple new wallets. And you should withdraw at random time intervals, not as soon as you can, but also not super far in the future all at once. You need to withdraw at random time intervals. So it's not easy to tell that you're the same person making that withdrawal. You also need to make sure you never reuse a wallet or address um, and that after you withdraw those funds, you never interact between those wallets. So you should never send money that went from Tornado Cash into a couple of your wallets back together later on because then you destroy the chance that those were two separate people and you link them directly together. So that's just like a really quick example of how a tool that can provide privacy can really quickly go awry. And that's true of basically almost every project out there. I'm not going to say every project or basically every, but very many projects out there that that tout privacy can be used privately and can achieve good privacy levels by someone who knows what they're doing. But if you don't have a clear understanding of how cryptocurrencies work and how blockchain surveillance companies work and how governments are surveilling blockchains, it gets really tricky. So that's like when I'm evaluating tools and, and the reason that I recommend Monero is not because it's a perfect tool. It does have flaws. It has some issues that you have to work around. If you have a a very advanced threat model, like you know that your your government is surveilling you specifically, it may not be enough to protect your financial privacy. Um, but for any grandma that goes out and downloads a wallet from an arrow and sends funds, she would gain strong privacy guarantees without having to do any extra steps. So those are kind of the things that are important for me. Um, again, it's tricky unless you have a deeper understanding. So it's definitely something you should get familiar with or find people within the community that you trust that that are actively looking at these things that are hopefully not kind of coming at it with a bias or with an eye to make money on you or to make money on other people but someone who's really kind of actively trying to find good privacy tools and kind of follow their recommendations but um, a few quick recommendations are if you're using bitcoin samurai wallet is an excellent tool it is the only wallet i will use for bitcoin 
um, it does a great job at helping you to, to gain solid privacy, and it has a lot of strong protections to prevent you from destroying the privacy that you gained when using it. Um, and then obviously, like I talked about, Monero, I think is an excellent tool. It's very easy to use. Uh, it's very easy to accept donations in. It's very easy to make payments in. It's, it's fairly broadly accepted. Um, and you don't need to worry about kind of jumping through any extra hoops when you use it. Just download any kind of wallet and get Cake Wallet or Monero Joe on uh, either of the app stores. Um, and you can just go ahead and use that on your phone, but you'll get strong privacy guarantees on chain. Um, so it's definitely tricky. I, it's a hard process to vet these projects, and I struggle with vetting them regularly. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a tricky area, especially when many projects will actively try to kind of talk themselves up and talk about how good their privacy is, even if it's not. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> um, uh, I don't I, I sure. don't know if I'm going to be able to top uh, Seth's answer there, like most of his uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, responses. Um, but what I can give is the perspective I have, which is probably a lot more of a normal perspective. So I don't have as much technical understanding as Seth has. So for me, it's actually a very frustrating problem to deal with, um, especially because, I mean, we're a pretty large group. So we get emails from emails from cryptocurrency projects pretty constantly. I'd say probably about once a week, we get an email from some cryptocurrency project um, saying that they're three times more anonymous than Monero. Here's why. Here's our website. Here's our white paper. And I go, like, why Why? Why am I going to, like, Monero is the standard. These are the standards. These are the things that we can probably build upon and make better. So for me, the most frustrating thing is having to distinguish what is needed and what is just not needed. And in probably 95% of the situations for me, I end up deciding this is probably not something that's needed. Um, because there's already an existing solution for it. It seems like so many people are trying to solve similar problems instead of just all putting their eggs in the same basket and having a solution that everyone can use. Um, and so frankly, from a privacy standpoint, it seems like Monero is the best thing to bet on right now, unless you're hoping to make um, improvements on Bitcoin um, with things like Samurai Wallet. And I know the Lightning Network's trying to improve privacy on Bitcoin. Those are things that Seth can talk more about. But that's kind of my perspective on all of these different solutions. It feels like it almost encourages the more individual proprietary solutions instead of focusing on one greater good that everyone can rely on. That is very opinionated in my perspective on the issue, and you can definitely disagree with that. Um, that's just how I've been seeing the whole industry lately. I think it's, I mean, I think your perspective is honestly more helpful for most people because that's, like you said, the more common approach. So I, it's helpful for them to see what a, kind of a, a normal person goes through and not someone who's been steeped in cryptocurrency for a few years at this point. Um, and I, I'll just make a, a couple quick recommendations for when you're trying to assess if a cryptocurrency project does care about your privacy. Um, and these will, they also apply to other privacy tools really. But the first one is just, is the project making kind of grandiose or impossible claims? Like if they're promising perfect privacy or perfect anonymity, or uh, complete security or complete privacy. If they're using these like uh, kind of overbearing terms to describe how incredible their project is, it's probably going to be something where they're not as good as they say they are, and they're trying to get you to to buy in to make money off you. Um, another key one is just: Are they open and honest about the shortcomings of the project? Like, do they do they actively try to find issues with their project? Do they actively share okay it's good at these things but it's not good at these things or it's it's good for these use cases but it's not good for these use cases or it provides good on-chain uh, privacy but it doesn't have good network level privacy if they're honest about those aspects uh, that's usually a good sign that they are a, a privacy a project that really does care about privacy that wants to build a good tool that that really does care deeply about those things so those are two really simple ones obviously there's a ton of other things you can look for but um, it's a really quick way to evaluate some, but some project and that applies well beyond privacy, but if they're making impossible claims. They're probably just out to get your money. And if they're being honest about shortcomings of the project, they're probably legitimate and legitimately trying to build a good tool or, or service. I think that's a really good one. It's kind of counterintuitive, but one thing I definitely look forward to is, is there a very good page that documents all of the specific problems with, you know, either the privacy or security guarantees. Yeah. Because if there isn't one, it means probably not enough people have looked at this <laughs> or not enough people have cared, right? At or least they don't for, want to share them. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Well, e even if they don't want to share them, right? I, there I, ideally should be some community member somewhere that writes them up, right? But yeah, that's definitely a thing too. So I, uh, like with Bitcoin, despite its disadvantages with privacy, people care, right? There's, there's a, a community of people that care. And Monero, there's a group of people that care. And so if you're just going through the list of, oh, this new VC funded zero knowledge proof project is up and running, you know, they, they might not have the, the group of people that care about it yet. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good point. So, and thank you, Henry, for your perspective as people, as someone who hasn't been so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, just eaten up and spat out with the cryptocurrency community over, over the years. So it's, it's good to have a bit of an outsider's perspective there. Uh, do either of you have some final closing thoughts, but I think, I think we covered a pretty good, uh, good set of things today. You can go ahead to first if you want. Sure. Um, I mean, nothing really crazy. Just uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm I'm glad that y'all are caring enough about privacy, at least, to jump in and, and kind of learn a little bit more. Um, hopefully, this is something that has just kind of showed you some, some easy ways you can dive into privacy, some reasons you should be kind of caring about your own personal privacy when using cryptocurrencies and just more generally. Um, but it's just it's very important that we start to think seriously about these things and and really start to take steps towards personal privacy uh, as soon as possible. I mean, it's it's never too late, but it is definitely you're better off the sooner you start thinking about those things. And if we can get enough people thinking deeply about privacy and taking steps towards personal privacy, it can make a huge difference um, in the cryptocurrency space and making tools that are resistant to government control, that are resistant to uh, attack to protect the users of those cryptocurrency projects um, and outside of the, the cryptocurrency space, it can really enable freedom and enable um, liberty in a way that is just not possible without privacy um, in a world without privacy. There's, there's no ability to have freedom of thought, action, anything like that. So um, it's a very important topic and it can be a little heavier, um, but it's also, it's an exciting one. There are tons of amazing projects doing work in the privacy space in cryptocurrency and more generally. Um, and there is, I think, really an awakening happening right now um, towards personal privacy and, and really data sovereignty as well. So um, thank you all for joining. It was, it was a, a ton of fun getting to jump in and chat a little bit and answer a few questions. And um, hopefully I'll keep uh, keep digging and, and maybe fall down that, that privacy rabbit hole. Yeah, um, everything Seth said, completely love it. And also, it's just been a pleasure to be here. Um, I feel like I'm always treated so well in the cryptocurrency community because all of you are so open-minded i feel like you have to be open-minded to be in the cryptocurrency community to some extent um just because it's such a new technology in in the scheme of things so um it's always a pleasure to be here and it's always a pleasure to kind of hear um just everyone's different worlds in the cryptocurrency space just because people are in there for different reasons some people are here for privacy some people are here for investing some people are here um because they believe it's the future of um payments just everything so it's always a pleasure um i don't want to ramble too much longer just thanks for having me and um thank you for all your questions and just listening thank you so much seth and henry um again henry uh, is the owner of tech War. seth is the host of opt out podcast you can learn more information about them pretty easily by just searching for those things and then for everybody else uh tomorrow i'm doing cryptocurrency trivia it's been what two months or something like that so Make sure to watch the sticky spot at the top of the subreddit about 5 p.m. Central. We'll probably be doing cryptocurrency trivia, but watch, watch the sticky spot uh, slot tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.